Now, I don't usually do this, but we're going to go back to the same passage we read last night, again, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. I don't know why, I just don't usually come back to the same place on the second night, but tonight it is, seems my heart is directed in that way to Isaiah, chapter 1 again, and verse number 18. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. We spoke last night just on the invitation, really, of the gospel. We really, didn't really get beyond the great gospel word of come. And the people that are being invited to come by God, people that are unworthy and undeserving, they are being invited, and God sincerely means it when he says, come and Isaiah conveys this message to this Old Testament people that had turned their backs on God, and yet God was inviting them to come. But there's a lot more in this verse. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. There's a lot packed into that verse. And tonight I just want to think about some of the change of what takes place when a person is saved because that's really why we are preaching the gospel. We're not preaching the gospel so that people would be entertained. We're not preaching the gospel because it's some kind of a membership drive. I, in a place very close to where Mr. Hunt is from, in Pugwash Junction, I suppose most would know, fairly famous. People are surprised they hear so much about it and they get there and it's only a little tiny dirt road and it's just a junction and there's not really any houses or anything around. And yet it, on... Canada Day weekend every year, there are six, seven hundred people flock to it for a big conference under the canvas tent, or it used to be canvas, now it's vinyl. But there was meetings going on, they built a new gospel hall, and Mr. James McClelland and myself, we were having gospel meetings, first series in the new gospel hall. And we were visiting busily through the country roads and up the dirt roads and down the paved roads. And they had a very, they have and always have had a very active Sunday school work. So the people are known. And the testimony of the Christians who live there was, was a very good testimony. So the people know about it. And, and when they built the hall, they worked very hard to use local contractors as much as possible, just so that it would have a good taste, if you will, in the mouth of the country people, the people around. So as we visited from door to door, people knew about the hall. And it was all built. And they had a contractor's supper, they called it, for everyone who worked in the hall. And, and they invited all those people. And they had a lovely white tablecloth catered meal that one of the Christians was specializes in catering. And it was a beautiful meal. And some of them were kind of afraid to come, but some of them came. And uh, as we visited through the community, the people thought they had it figured out. They thought, you guys do it just a little bit differently than everybody else. You have the fundraising drive after the building is built. And you could not convince them that we were visiting and we were inviting them to come, no strings attached, and we were not looking for money, and it was not a fundraising drive, nor a membership drive to fill the beautiful new building. And it's not what it's about here either. It's about the salvation of souls. It's because God is doing a work in our world. He sent His Son into the world to die on Calvary's cross. And with this tremendous investment in this world and the redemption of sinners, He wants the gospel message preached. And that's what we are here to do. We are here to preach that the salvation of the soul brings a tremendous change. It must bring a change. If it doesn't bring a change, then there's reason to question whether there's life. It brings a change. And there is a change in the verse that we have read, verse 18. 
It, a person is taken, for, uh, taken from their natural standing in their sins. And there is a change that comes about because of the gospel. It's not a change that we can bring about. And it's not a change that, that God says the sinner must bring about. It's impossible to do it that way. It's not the turning over a new leaf. It's not anything of the sort. The memorizing of a creed. It's nothing like that. But when a person is saved, the Lord Jesus describes it in John chapter 3 to a, to a man who knew what these verses were all about. He would have read these verses. He would have poured over these verses. And he likely thought they applied to someone else. But the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that you must be born again. Born from above. So that what happens when a person is saved, it's, it's, it's not just a changing over of the old, but there is something new altogether. There's a new nature. And in the Old Testament sense of the words Isaiah, he brings about and tells us something about this change. And so that's really what I want to think about tonight for a few minutes at the beginning of the meeting. First of all, let me just say this, that in the verse he says, come now and let us reason together. Sometimes people think that, well, if I could just have a word with God, if God would just give me an opportunity to speak with him, and sometimes people who, maybe they don't even really profess to believe in God, but they'll say, if God is real, and if I meet him at the end, I would like to have a few words with God. There's a few things I'd like to say to God. And they have all this list of things in their mind, mentally prepared, that they are going to tell God a thing or two. You see, that's not what it's talking about when it says, come now and let's reason together. It's the idea of, of a reasoning, a logic, not just on, heaven's lo on earth's logic, but by heaven's logic. It is the idea of a mediation. Let us mediate, let us argue together, let us come into a court of law, so to speak. And that is what precedes God's salvation. It's when a person is willing to take the place that God gives them. It's when a person is willing to allow God to condemn them. And they have nothing to say in their own defense. You see, Isaiah speaks and he says one of the things that he has to do with the magistrates in this very chapter and the judges among the nations is they were not judging rightly. And he says, just step into God's courtroom for a minute and allow me to take the place of the judge. And those who had taken the place of the judge to take the place of the guilty. Let us reason together on those grounds. I wonder if there's a soul tonight that has ever done that. If, if there's a soul that is willing to do that. Allow God to take the place of being the judge. Psalm chapter 75, and I think it's verse 5 or verse 7, it says that God is the judge. You see, we start to judge ourselves and we compare ourselves by how other people are doing. We compare ourselves by the people who usually are worse than us. And we think, well, as long as I'm better than them, I'm okay. And sometimes we think, well, I just kind of, surely if I do the best that I can, and you kind of have this standard of your own, and we bring ourselves alongside a standard that we have sort of made, and a list of things that we feel are important to us, and to our society, to our community, and so on. And as long as we measure up to this standard that we've come up with, we think we're okay. But that's not what God is saying. It's not what Isaiah is bringing out. He says a person who is going to get serious about their sins, they've got to allow God to have the final word, allow themselves to be judged by His standard. Sometimes human beings, we become so full of pride, we're not willing to do that. I remember visiting in Cape Breton Island one day, 
and coming to the door of a of a woman, a very sweet older lady. And we had a nice chat about the bird feeders and everything else that was around the place, finding common ground. And I told her about what I was there for, and she was just so impressed that a, a young man, I was actually in my early 30s, or in my 30s at the time, such a young man would come so nicely dressed to talk about spiritual things at her door. And so I thought, well, I have to be respectful for this, uh, of this lady because she was more than twice my age, that was obvious, and she was so kind and sweet. And so I, I just thought, I, I, I'd like to tell you about something special that happened to me in my life. And I began to tell her how I was saved as a young boy at six years old. And she was literally horrified. And she actually stood and she said, no. You did not deserve what you were saying at that age. And I said, yes, I did, according to the Bible. You may not want to think it. And maybe I didn't want to think it. But it's what God says is important. But try as I might, though I had taken the grounds of a guilty sinner willingly, and it was then and only then that I understand what, understood what the Lord Jesus did was for me. Though that was, I told her the story, yet I could not convince her that, of course, I think the implication was if that little boy deserved to be punished for his sins, then so did she. And she didn't want to face that. The verse says, come now and let us reason together. And then it begins to say, though your sins. You see, that's the problem, isn't it? Your sins. My sins. He deals with how serious the problem is here. He says, though your sins be as scarlet. Now, scarlet was a dye that came from nature. That little worm would crawl its way up into the trees and they would collect that worm and through the crushing of it and a process they would, they would come up with this red dye that, that they would use to dye the clothing. And because of its, it was readily available for, for nature, often it was the working garment. The purple came from the diver as he dove deep into the sea and took up the mollusk and the purple pigment was extracted from the shell of, of, a, of shellfish. But that, that was more expensive so that a person that was wore purple, he was obviously a very rich person. But when it came to the scarlet, it was the working garment. It was just that which was so readily available. And he says, though your sins be as scarlet, though it is like that dye from nature that has penetrated the, wor- the fabric of the working garment. What a picture of sin. Do you know why you and I cannot do something to save ourselves? Because that would be the works of our own hands and our own heart. And by nature, the fabric, the very fabric of human nature has been stained with the dye of sin. You, you take the garments that you wear and you, you take it apart. You take it apart thread by thread. And you see, through the dyeing process, that dye has penetrated and it has permeated. And so that no matter where you look in the garment, regardless of how you cut it or take it apart, the dye has penetrated so that we have what we sometimes call the depravity of the human nature. It is. It just simply means that the whole human fabric, all of, all of me, my whole heart, is totally and completely ruined by sin. It has been affected. Though your sins be as scarlet. You see, we're not just talking about the things that we do. That would be serious enough. And if that's all we were dealing with, then maybe, just maybe, we could at least slacken the breakneck speed with which we rack up sins. Maybe we could change our sins of the future. But you know, even at that, we could not change the sins of the past. 
But he says it's not just the things that we do. It's what we are by nature. Natures die. So that sin is serious, it has, it has penetrated, it has permeated my very nature. And in the sight of God, I'm not what God intends me to be. And I can never be, naturally speaking. Though your sins be a scarlet. I remember one time in, I would say in junior high school, I think it was, being an active boy, liking to play soccer. It could have been an elementary, I just forget exactly, but I remember getting my new jeans for the fall because we didn't get them at will back when I was growing up on the farm family. And so when school started, you, you got some new clothes. And when I, according to your growth, and I was growing and I had gotten these new jeans and of course, my mother said, no, David, don't be playing soccer in them. Don't be out on the soccer field. And don't be sliding into the bases on the baseball diamond. And sure enough, what happened but this one particular day, we were on the soccer field and I skidded and slid. And there was a big green grass stain right up the front of the pants, right up and up the side. Just, just a funny green streak. Well, my mother tried everything to get that out. And she couldn't get it out. And so eventually she decided to try and die over them. Well, something she had, some kind of a cleaner she had, had, had used had actually taken some of the coloring out. So there was a big white streak along with the green, along with the blue. And then she tried to die over it. Well, they were the strangest, sickest colored pants you have ever seen. The yellow, the, the yellow thread, it didn't stay yellow. It was now some kind of a sick mix of yellow and blue. And the green dye stain, it was just a darker shade of something between the two. You see, it just simply didn't work. The dye penetrated everything, this new dye. It affected the whole garment, but it didn't make it look any better. It didn't change it or, or put it back to its original condition in any kind of a sense. The garment was ruined. Do you know what Isaiah is saying by the Spirit of God? That sin literally ruins human nature. Now that's not a very nice picture. You may well say, listen David Hurley, you can get back on that plane and go back to Prince Edward Island because I don't want to hear that. Well, it's not originating with me. That's what he's saying. Sin ruins human nature. You know what the change of the gospel is? He said, though your sins be as scarlet, though sin has ruined who you are and what you are in the sight of God, though nothing you can do can put you back the way God created the human race, he says, I want to tell you about what God can do. It shall be as white as snow. Mr. Hunt and I, we follow our brave leader different years up into the north of Labrador. And when you're up there in the wintertime, up from Goose Bay on up north, going by snow machine, it's about 1,600 kilometers round trip if you go all the way to Nain and back. And there's something about it, though. When you go up there and there, there, everything seems so beautiful. I don't know what it's like in the summer. He has probably seen it some in the summer, some parts of it by boat at least. But I've only been up there really in that part of it in the winter time. And after a fresh snow and it just comes down and it just blankets everything. And you're just driving through this place and sometimes maybe on a, on a lake or an inland lake where the tracks are all obliterated and there's no other sign that a human being has gone before and you're just going across in the snow machine, across the frozen lakes and the coatings of snow and everything just seems so perfectly pure and white. You know where it came from? It came down from above. You see what the Lord Jesus was telling Nicodemus? He says, you must be born again. He says, there is a birth that comes from above. There is a change that happens from above. It must come down from above. It is not something that comes from within. 
It is not something that comes from your past or your thinking. This is something that comes from God. It is something that, that it cleans the person. It gives them a new nature. It is something new altogether. And then and only then, Isaiah says, that which comes down from above, white as snow, from the dye of sin, ruining the fabric of humanity to what God wants to do for the sinner, changing them entirely with a new nature. That which comes down from above. I want to tell you, this is a wonderful thing. You can almost say sometimes, just a little hallelujah when you think about what the gospel can do. And the salvation that God has given. Have you experienced it? I'm not saying have you turned over a new leaf. Do you know what it is to know from the word of God that you are clean in the sight of God? Cleansed. Justified. It's a wonderful thing to go to bed at night, to lay your head down and be able to sleep knowing that God sees me cleansed, cleared, justified by what Christ has done. But just think for a moment, he says, red like crimson, though your sins be red like crimson. You see, it's a similar idea. And maybe the dye was similar, but it seems to me at least that he says, Red like crimson. It's the brightness of it. It seems to me it's the individual stain that happens in a garment. And because of the distinctness of it, it stands out. So that it seems to me to be the individuality of sins. Sin. If you will, in the singular, as they happen. And they mark us. And God cannot... Just ignore them. Because they're like bright red. I remember when I was about four or five years old, my at the time, I, I, it's safe to say this, I have five sisters, but it's safe to say this because they're all many miles away. She was my favorite sister at the time. And she had moved out of home. She was a nurse and she had moved out. But now she was getting married and the, the wedding was at home in the family farm house. And... So that was, I remember all that. But I remember afterwards, there was a meal prepared in the place as well. It was a small wedding. And the dessert was strawberry shortcake. And Betty, being my favorite sister, it just was necessary, as she was leaving the household for good, for me to eat my strawberry shortcake sitting on my sister's knee. And I think you can see where that went. It was one little strawberry that I dropped that landed on her wedding dress and it was stained. And again my mother tried her stain removers and nothing worked. And for years that dress hang on a closet at home up in the old farmhouse and if you were playing in that closet or whatever with our friends you would come across it and they would always remember that one red stain. And I remember the day I came home and from junior high school and my mother said, Hey, look, look, look what I got. Look what happened. I got this new stain remover and look what it did. And it was gone. Do you see the picture when he says, Though they be red like crimson, you couldn't miss that strawberry stain. Even when it was in poor lighting, you couldn't help but see it. That's what every single sin is to God. For those of you who are younger who think, I don't have many sins. One sin stood out enough for Adam and Eve that they were driven out from the presence of God. And it will be no different for those who think not many sins is okay. But the good news of the change is, though your sins be as red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I don't know if you've ever seen sheep that really, really needed to be sheared. We didn't have sheep at home on the farm, but I remember at, at first when I was growing up, but later on after I was gone, my nephew bought some sheep from an old man who didn't have the energy or the strength to look after them. And those sheep hadn't been sheared for a couple of years. And those ewes, they were literally stumbling with the weight of matted fur and mud and burrs. And 
They stumbled around under the weight of what they had produced. And the sheep shearer came one day and he began to shear them. And I thought those old sheep, why did he buy those sheep? Those things are ready to die. But they weren't ready to die. They were just under the burden of their wool and the dirt of it. And when those sheep were sheared, that wool was taken away. And those little sheep, now they were little, that I thought had been sold, they acted so young they were literally bouncing and running and kicking up their heels. And that which they had produced naturally was taken away from them and it could never again be reattached. And he says, though your sins be as scarlet, when that is taken away, again it's linked with nature, but when that is taken away, it can never be reattached to the sinner. You see what happens at Calvary? Christ bore sin's judgment. He suffered what we deserved. And when a person has their sins taken away by what Christ did, when God takes them away, they will never again come up. They are removed eternally. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west. And they'll never come up again. It would be a wonderful thing if someone drank in the change of the gospel. And they fled to Christ. For the new nature. To be born again. To have their sins taken away. Because that's what is available in the gospel. And we pray that someone tonight will drink it in and take it for themselves.